So today we're going to go international and talk about the Celts around the world or the so-called Celtic diaspora. In other words, I guess how people of Celtic origin dispersed from their homeland and managed to conquer the world, so to speak, of course. And to do so, we are delighted and honored to welcome Professor Garrod O'Halveran. Hello, Professor. Good afternoon, Frederick, and uh, nice to be here. You are an award-winning musician, ethnomusicologist, filmmaker, and most importantly for us today, a cultural historian and the director of the School of Irish Studies at Concordia University, Montreal. First of all, what is your definition of the Celtic diaspora, or rather, the Celtic diasporas? The term diaspora is a very new term in the context of tracking the global journeys of the Irish, the Scots, the Welsh, the Bretons, the uh, Cornish and the people from the Isle of Man and the Asturians and the Galicians. It's a term that used to be used to describe the Jewish diaspora, the African diaspora. The term became popular in the 1990s Thanks largely to the work of President Mary Robinson. She lit her little candle in the presidential house in Dublin to remind people, both in Ireland and overseas, that we were all part of an extended Irish diaspora. And so since that time in the 1990s, we're using the term diaspora, but it is a very recent term that we use to describe this extraordinary global movement of people from the Celtic-speaking fringes of Europe. All right, so um, how similar were those Celtic diasporas between one another? And most importantly, perhaps, when did it all start? When did people from Celtic countries, so to speak, started to emigrate to other nations or countries? There is very little homogeneity about anything Celtic, even in terms of the ancient Celts. It's a very contentious issue, and it's a very contentious issue in terms of tracking the modern Celtic diasporas as well, because there is so much difference between the history of Wales, Ireland and Scotland. When we talk about the Irish and Scottish diasporas, we have to look beyond the so-called modern period. The Irish were world travellers very early. Even in the post-Roman period, in the early Middle Ages, you have a huge movement across the European mainland, particularly of early Irish scholars and indeed Welsh scholars into Brittany, for example. Even when we move towards modern times, you have this extraordinary alliance between France and Scotland, the old alliance, as they call it in Scotland. And you have huge numbers of Scottish soldiers migrating to France. We have movement again from the point of view of Ireland with the flight of the Earls. We have movement again after the Williamite Wars in 1690. So this is our diaspora to Europe and eventually with the opening up of the Atlantic, what really redirected the diasporas? It's clearly linked to economics and colonial development. In the early 18th century, Ireland is no longer on the edge of the old world. It's on the edge of the new World. It's the last point of departure for ships leaving Europe. So Ireland becomes the point of departure for European traffic going across the Atlantic, literally from the late 1500s. Ireland is swept up in that transatlantic cultural movement, driven by colonial greed, if you like, by economic opportunity, and also by religious opportunities in terms of, quote unquote, spreading the word of God in the new world. And so way before the big events, by which I mean the Highland clearances from Scotland and the Great Irish Famine, there is incredible movement. Thank you so much. So yeah, today we're going to focus mainly on the more modern aspects of those waves of migration. And I'm sure we'll come back to the Great Famine in Ireland and the Highland clearances in Scotland. But before we do that, could you please quickly specify where all those people from Ireland and Scotland and Wales, where they usually went to when they left their homeland and why? Well, I think what's interesting, Frederick, about the Irish aspect of that Celtic meta-narrative, in a sense, is that there are multiple layers. The Protestant Irish are very mobile in the 1700s. You find them in colonial America, in Canada, in Australia, in parts of the British Empire where they feel as much British as they do Irish. And very few of them would have felt Celtic, even though some of them were, in fact, Gaelic speakers. You have a whole series of colonial civil servants, administrators, 
administrators, business opportunists, and that would continue throughout the 1700s. You get an occasional Catholic in the mix, like Charles Carroll, for example, who's the only Catholic signatory of the Declaration of Independence. But for the most part, the Protestant Irish are the key players in the 1700s. And then, of course, the Napoleonic Wars change everything. There is very little movement across the Atlantic as a result of the long Napoleonic Wars. In 1815, that is the point at which immigration starts again. We have an incredible growth of immigration between 1815 and 1914. During that century, 8 million people left Ireland. Now, the Scottish element is different. The premise is that we need to clear people from the Highlands because the Highland clans are troublesome. We can ship them out to Canada. We can populate the New World with these Highland settlers. There is a half century of incredible depopulation of the Highlands of Scotland, a traumatic dislocation of Scottish society shipped across the Atlantic to places like Nova Scotia, Cape Breton Island, Newfoundland, Ontario, and then ultimately all the way out west. And you also have very prominent imperial companies like the Hudson Bay Company. The Hudson Bay Company is a major conduit of Scottish migration, particularly to places like the Hudson Bay itself and along the Arctic perimeter of Canada. They operated out of the Orkney Islands. They would have taken on board company clerks, workers, bureaucrats who ran their stations and collected the beaver furs stretching out across a whole network of Hudson Bay stations from the Hudson Bay to Alaska. And that in turn becomes a major vehicle of migration, a movement that would continue down into the 20th century. By 1900, we have 100,000 Gaelic speakers in Eastern Canada. Scots Gaelic is the third most spoken language in Canada by 1900. Scots Gaelic speakers living their lives, speaking Gaelic, some of them never becoming English speakers in Eastern Canada. The early Welsh, particularly Quakers, the Baptists in Wales, they relocate to Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia, and find refuge in William Penn's colony in colonial America. And then there's a break, and by the mid-19th century, the Welsh start to move again. And at that point, Wales is the mining centre for the British Industrial Revolution. And there are highs and lows. And when the lows come, the Welsh move. They move to parts of America where you have mining, particularly Pennsylvania. Cities like Scranton, for example, Pennsylvania, were founded by the Welsh. They move to places like Manitoba and Saskatchewan in Canada. They move to Utica in upstate New York, where they establish a Welsh newspaper, Idrich. And Idrich continued to publish in Welsh until the 1940s. And of course, the big Welsh migration takes place in 1865 to Patagonia in southern Argentina to the uh, Chiput River Valley. And this is an attempt to form a new Wales in exile. But of course, they are still subject to Argentinian law, but they eventually succeed in establishing a very substantial Welsh-speaking colony. Indeed, there are still Welsh speakers in Patagonia today. And when they show up in London to visit Wales, they're completely speechless because most of them don't speak English. They speak Spanish. They have to reach Wales to feel at home. And so there's a sense of continuous roots tourism that is driving the return journeys of the Irish and the Scots and the Welsh back to their home countries. So um, what about other places, such as Australia, for instance? How come some Irish people, for instance, decided at some point to move to Australia? The question of Australia is intriguing. The Irish who went to Australia went as political prisoners. Australia was a place of transportation, particularly from the 1830s. This was a way of getting rid of the surplus population. The poor, the beggars, the people of no property, the petty criminals, the Irish political problem makers. You put them on board a ship, it would take four months to get to Australia from Ireland in the early 1800s. Now, that record was eventually broken in the 1860s when they started to use schooners. A good schooner can get to Australia in 70 days. Eventually, the Irish would start to consider Australia as a site of settlement during the last quarter of the 19th century. And of course, we had the famous scheme called the 10 pound palm scheme, which was a scheme developed by the Australian government after World War II 
to attract settlers. The passage was £10, a very cheap ticket to Australia, and that too was an attraction for a lot of Irish people who went to Australia in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. And this would be the last wave of Irish settlement in Australia. Okay, thanks. Uh, and I guess it was not easy for an Irish or a Scottish or a Welsh family to acculturate to those new environments, be it Australia, Canada or the US. And I suppose it was not only about culture. Climate must have been an issue somehow. The challenge of climate has never been a real deterrent to the Irish. However, they have suffered, particularly in Quebec, for example, the Irish had no experience of Canadian winters. Uh, I mean, the possibility of a winter that would be at minus 30 for 10 weeks is unimaginable in Ireland. The Irish had very little experience of the kind of winter activities that would be required of them. They had very little experience of lumbering, for example, or working in the woods during the winter time to supplement their farm incomes. So not just the climate in and of itself, but the economic activities relating to climate was also a challenge. In terms of the United States, the Irish who arrived in New Orleans, for example, in the early 19th century, had no experience of Swamps. They had no experience of mosquitoes. We have no mosquitoes in art. So to deal with the tropical conditions in the southern American states was a horrendous experience. Um, the same would have been true of the Scots moving to Atlantic Canada. And the Scots who moved further south into the Midwest, for example, would have had no experience of the climatic extremes. The same would have been true of the Welsh who went to Patagonia. I mean, Patagonia is a high pampas or tundra desert. There is nothing like Patagonia in Wales. Luckily, they integrated reasonably well with the native population. They learned from them. For example, many of the Welsh become gauchos. They become cowboys in Argentina. And they learn to ride horses. So this is not just a climatic change. It's a lifestyle change that comes with new climate conditions. It's all about how you connect with the natives. It's how you connect with the indigenous population. You have to relearn your whole lifestyle and your whole life world. And... Yes, by all means, climate was a huge challenge. On the topic of assimilation and acculturation, let's talk about languages a bit. Many people who left their Celtic homelands spoke Celtic languages, sometimes as a second language, but sometimes as a first language. How did those Celtic languages survive in this brand new non-Celtic speaking environment? Well, ironically, Irish, Scots Gaelic and Welsh survived remarkably well given the challenges that they faced in the new world. It's generally the case that given the right circumstances, the original language will survive for two, if not three generations. Irish as a vernacular language would survive in Quebec until the 1950s. It would be maintained by people who never set foot on the island of Ireland. The same is true of the Scots. Now, what's interesting about Atlantic Canada is that it's very isolated. It's very rural and you had really no need of English. And I know in my own case, as an anthropologist, just working in Cape Breton Island, I've met Gaelic speakers whose great-great-grandparents left Scotland. In other words, they were there for five generations. Some of them spoke English very, very badly after 120 years. In Argentina, for example, the Welsh would continue speaking, some of them down to the present day. You still have one Welsh chapel in Canada delivering services every week in Welsh. So it's intriguing how despite all of the multiculturalism, the mutation and the hybridity and the transculturation, etc. The languages have somehow maintained a presence in North America down to the 21st century. All right. And do you think we could say the same about culture in general? Did the Irish, Scottish and Welsh cultures always thrive in their new environments? So many indigenous folk traditions of North America, particularly music, song and dance, have managed to find a very important place in the tapestry of North American and indeed South American culture. For example, the Welsh brought their Eisteddfod, their national festivals, to both North and South America. The Eisteddfod becomes 
the annual focal point for people of Welsh ancestry all over the world. And that has continued down to the present day. They're not as Welsh speaking as they used to be in North America. But you have a tradition of Welsh choirs, which is very, very popular at the present time. And so the Welsh Eisteddfod becomes a major vehicle of preserving Welsh culture. The same is true of the Irish and Scottish traditions. You have a whole network of Highland games all over North America involving piping, tossing the caber, fiddling, dancing, dressing in kilts and Scottish food, you know, haggis, etc, etc. A lot of it is reinvented tradition, but I don't think there's any province in Canada today that does not have its Highland Games. The oldest Highland Games in the world is held in the town of Anaganish in Nova Scotia. And of course, the Irish too, they've made an extraordinary contribution to American musical culture, not just in terms of traditional music, but also in terms of dance, in terms of Hollywood, in terms of American song. Uh, so I think... You know, to answer your question in a very broad sense, it's virtually impossible to avoid Celtic tradition in North America. It's ubiquitous. I think what's interesting is that over time, viscous traditions like music or like dance or like song or like festivities and festivals, none of these human activities are ethnically selective. They're not exclusive. And I think that um, certainly the Irish and the Scots were very sociable people. They liked to have a good time and they liked to to share their traditions with whoever they met. And even today, you have Irish music activities and Irish music communities in places like Cuba, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, all over the United States and Canada. So we're very fortunate. Our language may have declined, but I think our broad musical culture and our external cultural selves have survived extraordinarily well in the new world. Okay, and what about in terms of identity? Does the contemporary Celtic diaspora feel somehow connected with their counterparts in other countries? Is pan-Celticism a thing in North America? The modern pan-Celtic movement is very popular in Europe, and it's very popular in France, you know, where you have the Festival Celtic de Lorient, bringing European Celts together. We really don't have the equivalent of that pan-Celtic sense in North America. And I think that's a, a very significant difference between North American Celts and European Celts, by which I mean people who claim some connection to a Celtic past. Having said that, what's interesting about the United States and Canada in the late 19th century, there is a sense of pan-Celtic awareness. We have a lot of philo celtic societies, particularly among the urban Irish. They start to feel a connection with the extended pan-Celtic world. Large largely because of these pan-Celtic societies. But that did not continue down into modern times. And I think largely because America changes very quickly. You have an industrial revolution every five years. You have an event like the Great Depression, which radically changed the United States. And by the time immigration from Scotland and Ireland and indeed Wales starts again after World War II, there is a whole new sense of Irishness and Scottishness in urban America. But the recent movement of pan Celtic festivals in Europe has not really translated into North American life worlds, if I can use that expression. You do occasionally encounter a Celtic festival, but for the most part, they're Irish festivals or they're Highland Games or they're Eisteddfod. There is a sense of the Scottish, Welsh, Irish worlds only. That's one very fundamental difference between the European world and the North American world of the Celt today. Okay, uh, since the 20th century at least, many descendants of these migrants have tried to revive and possibly recreate their Celtic cultures and identity and languages, especially but not exclusively in the US. They consider themselves Irish or Scottish or Welsh, even though most have never set foot in Ireland or Scotland or Wales and do not speak the language. How does that make you feel as a cultural historian and as a an Irishman. 
Uh, that's a wonderful question, Frederick. If you asked me that question 30 years ago, I would have given you a very angry answer. But today, I think I have learned a lot in the last 30 years. I think the cynical answer would be to suggest that many of these claimants to Irish, Scottish, Welsh ancestry are recreational Celts. If you consider that some of these people have been in North America for six, seven, eight, nine, ten generations, their whole genealogy is very mixed and they have a menu of ancestral backgrounds to choose from. Why didn't they choose Mexican or Lithuanian or Italian? They're only one-eighth Irish or they're only one-tenth Scottish, but yet they want to be Welsh or Scottish or Irish. And I think a lot of it has to do with the visibility of the Irish and the Scots, particularly in American and Canadian popular culture. Now, we also need to remember, of course, that, you know, here in Canada, Multiculturalism is promoted by the Canadian government. It's a contemporary issue in Canada that people have the right to be something else other than just Canadian. And I think the same is true in America where multiculturalism means something different. But there is this sense of I'm American, but I'm also something else. I'm also Scottish or Irish or Lithuanian or Jewish. I think that the government policy, in a sense, is prominent in their choice. But I also think that being Irish or being Scottish is exhausting because of Hollywood, for example. It's exotic because of Mel Gibson, because of Braveheart and, you know, Rob Roy and, and all of the stock Celtic historical superheroes. There's an element of historical sexiness, if I can use that expression, about being Irish or about being Scottish. And I think that a lot of Americans discover their past because of Hollywood. We need to convince people who enjoy watching Mel Gibson scream freedom at the end of the movie. We need to get these people into our courses and into our classes. And we need to educate them a little bit more so that they understand who they are and you know that they know that they're part of something that's much more meaningful than simply Hollywood recreation. We hope you enjoyed traveling with us around the Celtic world. If so, don't forget to like and subscribe and share. You know the drill. Hopefully someday we'll do the same for the Bretons and possibly for the Asturians and the Galicians who also deserve their own video about their diaspora. We'd like to thank Garo. It's always a pleasure working with such great academics and, you know, nice human beings overall. Mm, well, I guess that's it. Thank you for your support and thanks to every single one of our 1,000 subscribers. We'll see you soon. Slon.